Okay. This is where it gets interesting. All right, let's go. The story of LDAP. I, I, I walk us through this from its inspiration. I mean, you just teased about it uh, a few minutes ago, but um, this is in principle why we're here. All these people who are listening to this are, are practitioners some th- almost 30 years later yeah. of this technology Thanks. that is, yes, <laughs> that has obviously stood the test of time. Um, and there's a reason for that. So let's hear some of the story. Well, that got its start. Uh, as I mentioned, I was at the University of Michigan, and uh, the university itself was kind of going through a transition at the time. They were going from this mainframe system uh, that ran a homegrown operating system called MTS, the Michigan Terminal System. Mm. It's a great operating system. What was it founded on? Was it? Um, it was a IBM. IBM uh, AS400. You know, yeah. Or OS 390. OS 390. Yeah. Um, operating system uh, clone, basically, mm-hmm. and. Uh, they were sort of moving away from that to a more distributed system where you know campus email and directory and so on were all on this mainframe and they needed something to replace that uh, in the new distributed environment where across campus this was you know late 80s uh, was starting to pop up all you know PCs and Macintoshes and uh, you know some Unix machines Sun Microsystems in the yep. engineering college and so uh, I got hired as part of a group of young Turks who were kind of charged with uh, leading that rebellion, as it turned out to be. And one of the big um, problems was, what are we going to use for a directory service? And so uh, at the time, you know, OSI, the OSI stack, seven layer OSI stack was going to be the next big thing. And it had a directory called X.500. X500, right. Yeah, and um, the problem with X500 was the only implementation you could find was this really gigantic uh, stack of software um, that was called ISO-DE. It was created by Marshall Rose and Steve Kill and some other folks. And uh, the, you know, on our campus, we had 50,000 students, and they had Macs and PCs, and it was really too much to expect them to run this stack, and I didn't want to port it there. It really only ran on Unix. And so uh, I had, with a couple of colleagues at Michigan, I created something called uh, Dixie, D-I-X-I-E, which was for, uh, it stood for directory interface to X500 implemented efficiently or in an internet environment, depending on who we were talking yes. to. Yes. I didn't want to offend the X500 Very clever. People. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so Dixie got some traction. It was a little library and a server and uh, a couple of clients that we wrote. And uh, then uh, some folks that I knew uh, that were working with the IETF had seen it and said, um, you know, hey, you should really think about creating a kind of a standardized version of this. Come to the IETF and and do that. And so so that's where LDAP came from. So I went and um, uh, worked with the IETF to create the protocol LDAP. Um, this, uh, a couple of folks I worked with at Michigan, Mark Smith and, and Gordon Good and Brian Beecher, we worked on the first implementation of LDAP, which uh, got, you know, we made open source and got very widely used mm-hmm. and formed the basis for open LDAP and a bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, really started getting some traction in that environment. And um, then, uh, you know, kind of simultaneously, Netscape was uh, had had burst on the scene with um, the Mosaic browser, browser yeah. and um, they had seen sort of the writing was on the wall for Netscape. They had seen Microsoft, you know, coming with the browser, and so they were moving as fast as they could to build an enterprise software business based on um, some server products, you know, web server, That's mail right. server, and so on, and. Uh, they again recognized the need for, with all these different servers, recognized the need for a directory system to tie them together. And so uh, they found us at the University of Michigan, they hired us uh, at Netscape, and that was sort of the beginning of, of uh, LDAP's commercial success. Interesting. So was it, um, did other comp- did you commercialize this? And did other companies, because uh, clearly other larger um, software vendors were instantiating you know the same concept in their own directory infrastructure yeah. so they could sell it on behalf of themselves to their own client base what, um, what was the business thinking you know you so you had this technology mm-hmm. um, where did you want to take it 
Well, for me, um, you know, certainly when I was at Michigan, I was just trying to solve the problem <laughs> yeah, I had, right? I was trying to solve my problem, which was a directory where you, you know, everybody could have a, have a your name at umich.edu email address, and you could, you know, at the time, the lookup protocol was finger, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, finger me at the University yeah. of Michigan, right? And uh, I wanted a directory to support that. And, um, you know, we really had started kind of with identity and email as, as the backbone and hadn't started thinking about, you know, printers and devices and... Yeah, other objects. Uh, other objects um, that, that really came later. But, you know, the original idea was to get as many people to use it as possible, which is why we created the software as open source and got it out there as a university that was really our... You know, we thought at the time it was our, it was, that was our mandate. Right? For sure. We were trying to make the world a better place through, through software. Yeah. And it was also the time where, uh, you know, Free Software Foundation was recently formed. And so there was a, you know, big was a beginning, really, of the, of the free software movement. Um, and then once I got to Netscape, uh, you know, we, we took the open source software and used that as the basis of the Netscape directory server. But that, of course, was a commercial endeavor along with um, you know, everything else that, that Netscape did. But we still stayed involved with the standards effort. And by that time, a lot of other companies, including Microsoft, had gotten on board with LDAP. Um, Microsoft, I think, a little bit kicking and screaming. But Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about those guys okay. in Redmond in, in a bit. Was So from a, a, a technology perspective, was the, uh, it, you know, obviously authentication, authorization, you know, the primary goal. Yeah. We see, um, L, in our case, open LDAP, but our, our directory structure used for um, for its database capacities. Obviously, the, the, mm -hmm. the management of the metadata about a specific <clears throat> object, like a user, for mm -hmm. example. Was that part of your original design, or did you extend into that? Oh, but that was definitely part of the original thinking, and I, I really can't take credit for that. I mean, that you know, LDAP got its start as a as a front end to X five hundred, right? Correct. As a lightweight way that we could put a client a shim, so on, to speak exactly to x500 and then it was along around ldap version 3 where you know it was clear the internet was taking off x500 not so much and so uh we thought well let's see if we can kind of break ldap off from x500 and you know why not it's just mm -hmm. a protocol we could make our own database um so that and that was the the open source implementation that really right. started to to take off and so we inherited a lot of the, you know, the data model and so on from X.500, which was, I think, really, you know, pretty well thought out and, sure. and extensible. And, um, you know, we added some things uh, for sure. But, uh, yeah, that was the original idea. Yeah, I mean, to my earlier point about standing the test of time, you're right. The abstraction that was put into that original meta model was, you know, there was a lot of forward thinking, which yep. was beautiful to see.